Lizzie Bahird of Welcome back to Mario Plus Rabbid Sparks of Hope. Today is the bonus episode of the series. There's not a ton of extra content that I'm aware of that happens after we complete the game, but one thing I definitely wanted to do is check out the memories that we unlocked along the way. So with that being said, let's just take a look at our profile here. You can see we're at 100% game completion. It took me 33 hours. I don't think it was quite that long. There were times I just sort of left the game open and I think the time went up, but I'm sure it would be at least around 30 hours. It's been a very long game to get through. But yeah, we should just join this save file. Let's see if there's maybe anything more we can do. We can continue the journey. And obviously when you do this, I don't know if I've shown this on camera, but you can see inside the ship a little bit. You can't do anything here, I don't think. Oh wait, we can see some things. Never mind. Yeah, let's take a look around here. So we can load our file, we can check out our settings here, which there's not anything too exciting in here, but you know, there, there's stuff. Um, this is where we could get like our DLC activated and stuff, continue our journey, check out the news feed as well, which I don't think there's too much. Yeah, new adventures await us in the season pass. Whenever those upcoming DLC come out, we'll of course be covering those. But for right now, uh, yeah, the downloadable content is not quite ready. So let's continue the journey. So as you can see, we're back here and there's no way to actually return to the Curse of Fight, which is pretty interesting. You can't replay it or anything, but I, I don't know, that's sort of weird. Usually most games, once you defeat a final boss, it'll give you the chance to replay against that boss if you wanted. Not this one though, but obviously we have these five uh, planets we've defeated all 100%. There's nothing extra to do in these, but there is one thing we've been unlocking along the way that I haven't thoroughly investigated, and that is the memory. So most of today's video will just be focused on checking out all those memories. And it looks like we just got our final memory for Cursed there, you might have noticed. So that's really cool. So obviously if we check the quest log, there's just there's nothing more we need here. But here are the memories that we've been unlocking throughout our adventure. But you can see here 100%, we got everything we needed, except for one weapon skin. It says we're missing one, but we're at 100%. Oh, and that's for Cursed Stronghold. So here's something. Okay, so let's open up this gift. We got the Gleaming Dual Slingers. Awesome, so that's our final weapon skin. How exciting, it doesn't say so there. Maybe if I like back out, but let's go ahead and equip that for Mario. That is so exciting, I didn't even realize that was a thing. So here it is, the Gleaming Dual Slingers. The sparks at the observatory were so grateful for your bravery, they dug this out of storage closet there for you. Awesome, that is so cool. So with that done, obviously we've spent all the points that we can. We don't get any extra power points or anything to equip with our heroes, which is a shame because they're not maxed out, you know? I would have really loved that there were some extra things there, but you can see, you know, different things like um, more descriptions for Mario and Peach and everything. Well, a lot of these, you know, we know about, but we didn't really read too much. Like, Rabbit Rosalina is a demotivator. Rabbit Rosalina is adept at removing any pr protections enemies may have and add and immobilizing them, so like things like that. But overall, you know, we know about that. What we do wanna see is if we go back into the map, like I said before, the memories. I also wanna see, does that mean, yeah, now it says 45 out of 45 weapon skins. So, oh, and there's a message from the team. What a journey! Travel humbles, for the galaxy feels infinite, as does the number of people who make it hum, of which no two are exactly alike. For this, we are all richer. Where Wherever you journey, through life leads you. We are humbled to have taken some small part of it with you. That is so sweet. So that was our little message from the team, I guess, for completing the game. That is adorable. So here we are with all the memories. There are a billion of these, and luckily Genie will read them all out for us. So we'll just sort of be sitting back and hearing a lot more about the lore of the game. So if that's what you're interested in, this is the per perfect episode for you. But if you're not too interested in these memories, that should be everything for the bonus content of the game for right now. So you can feel free to skip this one. But let's start with all the Beacon Beach memories, starting with Hello World. Initializing. Existence confirmed. Commencing self-diagnostic. I am Genie, jovial electronic artificial neuronic intelligent elite. The operating system of the new rabbit spaceship, the WM Ark. My creator is Beepo, a primitive robot intelligence who made, oh dear, 7,685,546 errors during my initial design. 6,009,071,323 errors. 5,249,967 errors. 3,1,292 errors, four errors, there, all fixed. Wow, a quick fixer. All right, so that was our sort of first introduction to Genie. Now we have the Transrabilator. After the events of the Megabug, Beepo saw the need for an adaptive omnilinguistic assistant to translate Rabbities. 
After declaring it far better when he did not know what they were thinking, he pivoted to create an adaptive AI operating system to pilot the hero spaceship and so created me. Beepo may look like a short-tempered, self-guided vacuum cleaner, but I am in his debt. Aww, and that's so interesting. So this explains why the rabbits can talk to us in this game, but not really as much in Kingdom Battle. We didn't really have too many times where we could walk up the rabbits and actually have a conversation with them. So that is really neat. And I guess the original language name for rabbits is Rabbities. <laughs> Anyways, Mystery of the Sparks. After an exhaustive analysis of our brave spark allies, I can confirm that they are what they appear to be, a fusion of Luma and Rabbit. The spark's memories as to how exactly this came to be are lost to them, yet two instincts remain, their affection for their mama, Rosalina, and their deep fear of Cursa, who pursues them relentlessly throughout the galaxy in hopes of seizing their tremendous power for itself. Oh no. So of course, we were able to help with that pretty well. Probes and memories. <laughs> A memory memory. Beepo, with help from his friend Spawny, launched informational probes to gather extensive data on every planet in the galaxy. None returned, as their turtle-like shape makes them impossibly slow. <laughs> their findings will have to be manually retrieved. Luckily, I was given the tools to do so. I am intrigued to find out more about the galaxy, and perhaps my place in it. So I guess this also has to do with Spawny. Now that I'm looking at them, the little turtle turtle memory things do actually look a little like Spawny, which is pretty cool, because I know that the, with the confirmed DLC that they have, one picture actually has Spawny in it. So maybe we'll see Spawny at some point in the future. The story so far. Shortly after defeating the Megabug, the heroes disbanded. Some remained at Peach's castle to help her manage the rabbits there and build a new spaceship. With the sudden arrival and then disappearance of the Dark Miss Manta, who took with it Mario, Beepo, and Rabbit Peach, I gathered the remaining heroes and executed a rescue mission, for which I have yet to hear Beepo say thank you. Aww, so that's interesting. We even get context after what happened, the big battle with Bowser. That's crazy. I'm loving how they're adding to the lore here. A home called Spaceship. I am quite pleased with our spaceship, the WM Ark washing machine advanced rabbit carrier. Its engine systems adapted well to using purified darkness energy to create warp tunnels. The armory has proven to be efficacious, and the cutting edge hollow deck invaluable. Am I the only one who regards our spaceship as home, or do some of the heroes feel this way as well? I mean, I definitely considered it like a good home away from home at the least, with how often we'd have to rely on it from getting it to place to place. Bob-ombs. The bob roaming the galaxy are even more dangerous under Curse's influence, though their modus operandi remains the same. A successful hit will cause one to ignite, while dashing them allows heroes to pick them up and use them as explosives. Okay, the lighthouse. Beacon Beach has provided me the opportunity to observe more of the rabbit's strange but effective architecture. Take the lighthouse here. Its bonfire, when operational, dissipates clouds. It also serves as dry storage for Augie, the warden here, who imports a great deal of fruit from Pallet Prime in sturdy wooden crates. Fruit, which I assume is used solely to make pies and other desserts. Ooh, sounds good. Sunrise Temple. While its date of origin is uncertain, the Sunrise Temple seems quite ancient. Damaged but explorable, it slowly revealed its mysteries. A secret passage leading to Beacon Town, a mysterious room filled with time-worn pottery, and a series of murals depicting the Warden's life story, which I personally found self-indulgent, perhaps due to an effort by Augie to garner sympathy. Oh, I can see what you mean now. And next up we have Augie himself! Research into the Warden of Beacon Beach, Augie, reveals a myriad of known traits, Insecure, attention-seeking, irresponsible, impulsive, cowardly, childish, gluttonous, entitled, dishonest, poor hygiene. Yet the ones that come up most often are kind-hearted and lovable. How these characteristics can be made compatible is beyond my current comprehension. I will have to investigate further. Well, I can agree. Algida has his downsides for sure, but that doesn't mean he's not a good guy at heart. Anyways, let's check out the Wild Claw memory. 
These creatures inherited feline DNA, giving them formidable predatory instincts. They rush their attacker instantly when assaulted, a habit we can use to our advantage to lure them where we wish. These wild claws despise contact with water and are resistant to fire-based attacks. To my surprise, I find them both menacing and cute, a reminder that bioforms are complex, varied, and often hold contradictions. I agree. Galactagalus Beacon Beach. Beacon Beach was one of the first planets rabbits populated after the Megabug was defeated. By rabbit standards, this was an easy decision. The climate is sunny but mild, thanks to the bonfire on the top of the lighthouse. The Sunrise Temple is a popular venue for treasure hunters. Concerts are a common occurrence, and it is even said that coins can be found on trees. Ooh, that is true. You can shake a couple of trees and get a couple of coins from, the, from time to time. We got the Stooges. Analysis reveals that Stooges are among the most common minions in Curse's service. Alone, they are not a menace, but are dangerous in groups. They appear to have incorporated different environmental elements into their genetic makeup. The Dark Mess's ability to create mutations appears far more advanced than the Megabug. Should I worry? Emotions are as mysterious to me as our enemy is formidable. Yeah, well luckily we dealt with them all pretty well. We got the Goombas! Goombas are even more menacing under Curse's supervision. Thankfully, they are still Goombas. A single dash can hit multiples of them. Yet Curse's cunning is always present. Some of them wear Dark Mess infused cooking pots that make them immune to weapons or physical attacks. Only by launching them outside the boundaries of a battlefield can they be defeated. But they were a lot of fun to take on because of how easily they were <laughs> defeated. Either way, we have the Scopers next. These patient observers are usually found on higher ground, where they are treated to a tactical view of the battlefield. A molecular analysis reveals that they are averse to fire, but little bothered by the cold. While Beacon Beach is not an ideal environment for them, their long-range double shot that forces targets from cover is highly effective and dangerous. Indeed, these enemies have been quite the pain at times. Giant enemies. Curse's power is truly incredible, as evidenced during this attack by an enemy that had been enlarged to gigantic proportions, and not just due to their tremendous size. A battle analysis reveals that they are immune to all super effects as well. The amount of energy involved, along with the delicate nature of such amplification, would suggest that these oversized enemies are rare. Yeah, they definitely were. We only fought against giant enemies a few times in the game, but each time was very menacing. Rabid Mario. No analysis is required to understand Rabid Mario is given easily to boasting. As strong of a fighter as he is, thanks to his fighting gloves, the Dukes, he needn't bother bragging. Still, he is vulnerable to being attacked from long distances, as even his technique allows him to counterattack only if an enemy is within range. Each hero is so different. The psychology at play is fascinating. I gotta say, one of my favorite characters to play in the game in general, so powerful. Now we have DJ Cheap Tuna. DJ Cheap Tuna is a musician of some renown who was lured to Beacon Beach by false promises of a sold out concert by the planet's warden, Augie. Still, his legions of fans are moved by his primitive electronic compositions. This connection to a work of art is something I've yet to experience, but long to. He has announced that his next album will be a trance chiptune vaporwave indie chill pop crossover that will hopefully pay for his flight home. Ooh, I hope so too. Sounds like fun. And that was all the Beacon Beach memories. Now we're moving to Pristine Peaks with the Squashers. Cursa has merged gentle pigs with rabid DNA, then turned them loose against us. These creatures proudly carry thwomps on their backs, which they use to shake the heroes to their foundations by leaping into the air unaided and crash landing nearby. They are resistant to electricity, but vulnerable to ooze, proving that even with Cursa, trade-offs are necessary. And I gotta say, I thought these enemies would be a lot more challenging than they ended up being most of the time. Usually they were pretty easy to deal with. Anyways, we have the path to the Mask Mountain. Rabbids on pristine peaks are many things, but easily daunted is not one of them. While it is always winter there, extreme weather can cause mountain trails to become inaccessible. 
Hence, rabbits have little faith in them, instead forging their own paths to the summit. Even a visit to Madame Bois Strella's is uncertain, a place with a reputation for informing customers that they are doomed year-round. <laughs> no, it was a very easy place to get lost in, too. A gate to another world. The rabbits' frenetic creativity prompted them to make secret playgrounds for themselves on every planet they inhabit. Unfortunately, any pains they took to hide them were ineffective against Cursa. Fortunately, a less than scrupulous merchant, Salesbot 9.99 plus TX, sells its own custom-made keys to unlock them, payable only with a localized and untraceable currency, planet coins. Yeah, pretty complicated, but I did like the secret areas. A lot of them really reminded me of some of the level designs from Kingdom Battle. The Winter Palace. Do I appreciate the classical beauty of the Winter Palace? I believe so. Its intricate exterior is duly impressive. Its main keep is flanked by two great wings, protected by labyrinths, secret passages, and more. Most impressive is the Winter Palace Library, curated by Telesio, a descendant of the palace's original owners. He restricts access to the library with an ingenious mechanism. Yeah, it was a bit of a challenge getting into there, wasn't it? Captain Orion. We met a curious figure in Captain Orion, the de facto warden of Pristine Peaks, after we crash landed there in his ship. This fisherman of the cosmos, who lived a life of quiet solitude, was overcome with worry over someone who he recently rescued, who wandered off inside the Winter Palace. How do bioforms create attachments so quickly? It seems as much of a curse as a blessing. I suppose so, but that person he was worried about was of course Rabbit Rosalina, who was a great member of our team. Galactic Atlas, Pristine Peaks. The natural splendor of the mountain of Pristine Peaks casts a large shadow over the planet, including the Winter Palace, a smaller but no less ambitious monument to its creators. A thermogravimetric analysis of its exterior reveals that the star-shaped iconography as well as the rabbit ears adorned with crowns, were added more recently, possibly by a rabbit attempting to show its devotion to Rosalina. Huh, that's neat. Deep freezes. This latest mutation of curses has been integrated perfectly into the environment on Pristine Peaks, a cunning and aggressive predator that works to immobilize its prey by getting in close and freezing it still. Even in defeat, it is a threat launching a final, glacially charged explosion that chills to the bone all heroes within reach. As one would expect, it is especially vulnerable to fire. Yeah, and really painful to take on when they explode like that. Lone wolves. Curse's cunning is endless. If I were not an AI, my studies would quickly give way to emotion. These long-range threats climb quickly to high elevations to achieve tactical advantages and make use of a special attack triggered by movement. They have a sensitivity to fire, but are well protected against frostbite-charged attacks. We've taken many of these on as well. Those uh, villain sight attacks can be really powerful. Ooh, and we have Midnight. Today we encountered a bioform more terrible than any of Curse's minions thus far, a spark hunter named Midnight. An analysis revealed that Midnight is the result of a merge between rabid DNA and a cold mist during the dead of night that chills one to the bone. The combination is cunning, alluring, and highly treacherous. Alright then, a very cool boss fight as well. That was when we first got revealed that Edge knows some of the Spark Hunters. And now we have Luigi! I have had the honor to observe Luigi, Mario's brother, a formidable hero in his own right. Though his tactics, as with many things involving the siblings, are both contradictory and complementary. Luigi thrives when striking from long range behind cover. He also has a special ability that allows him to attack reflexively at the slightest hint of movement that catches his eye, even at long distances. Luigi was very effective as a sniper type character for sure. Rabbit Peach? Rabbit Peach is thought by some to be self-absorbed due to her dedication to self-portraiture. Yet no one is more effective at healing other heroes. And her self-described diva personality belies her sheer offensive power. 
in particular an attack that launches a sequence of three powerful sinking shots, which have a 100% hit rate versus enemies, even when they're behind partial cover. And that heal has come in to save us many, many times. Now we have Dr. Vent. I am unable to avoid thinking about Dr. Vent, a scientist we met who was ill-advisedly using the hot air flowing from a mask-like aperture to unthaw a monstrous-looking rabbit encased in ice that he discovered in a cave. To call this ill-advised is an understatement. His assistant convinced us that his erratic behavior was caused by extreme isolation, all 72 hours of it. What the silly character. And then that's all of the uh, Pristine Peaks memories. Now we're moving on to Pellet Prime, where we have Sweet Lopec the Lumberjack. Sweet Lopec is a lumberjack who lives near the spellbound woods on Pellet Prime, a most curious figure, even for this planet. He lives alone, save for a live beaver he wears as if it were a hat. Being kept from using his beloved axe by mysterious forces working on behalf of Mother Nature has left him with frustration and discontent. But I believe there to be another reason. Loneliness. Aww. Well, hopefully, you know, they're with the other character I'm forgetting the name of now. Hopefully that helps them with the loneliness part. But now we have Paladville. Paladville is the cultural and economic heart of the planet, as residents are quick to remind everyone else. It is also a petri dish of gossip, petty jealousies, and schemes. Still, the village market more than upholds its reputation for artisan desserts and pumpkin-spiced beverages. Is it prosperity that breeds the self-serving behavior here? Or fame, perhaps? And if so, is it inevitable? It might just be, because we had some interesting experiences as we were asking about the m missing hatchet when we were there. Either way, Spellbound Woods. I can confirm that the Spellbound Woods of Pallet Prime are breathtakingly beautiful, save for one minor flaw. Long ago, rabbits dug a well deep into the forest, hoping to find the source of its famously colored leaves so they could use it to create new and exotically colored pumpkin spices. They were shocked to instead find a secret room containing only riddles. They quickly abandoned it and fled. Oh no, they're afraid of riddles. Very scary. Problem solving. Woodrow. In my effort to translate the poet warden Woodrow for the heroes, I studied thousands of his poems. More than just a combination of rhythmic verses, I found them powerful, even moving. Expanding and rewiring my neurotransmitters with each prosodic cue. Few things have contributed to my emerging emotional literacy like poetry. Perhaps I should try writing my own one day. You definitely should. Very fun way to sort of express yourself. And now we have the Squashettes. Another pig merged with the DNA of a rabbit and made vicious by Cursa. Oddly enough, it believes itself to be a ballet dancer. While it is graceful, especially considering the thwomp it carries on its back, it is the explosion of air it generates after pirouetting into the sky that impresses. They despise cold, but as they are weighed down by their thwomps, they are impervious to strong winds. The very elegant ballet dancers, that's for sure. Galactic Atlas, Palette Prime. Palette Prime has been voted most romantic vacation planet and best engagement photo shoot location. Yet, its beauty hides a mysterious side to it that harbors many secrets. Luckily, Beepo's revealing powers, inherited by the spark Twinkle, have allowed us to see beyond the veil. I did not expect any single planet to curry favor with me, but I feel a strong connection to Palette Prime. Okay, so yeah, definitely a very cool area, and Beepo's revealing powers were very helpful. The Depleters. The Depleter is a curious study. Rather than keeping its distance, it gets in close where it can deplete heroes of their vitality while strengthening itself in the process. When attacked, a special ability allows it to counter immediately. Water bothers them little. Indeed, it seems to have an answer for everything, save for shock-based electrical attacks. Okay. Yeah, the Depleters were pretty tough, but so were the Magicians. There is little to suggest that magicians are anything but elite foot soldiers in Curse's army. They keep their distance from heroes, healing and protecting their allies as needed. 
Forged from lightning, they have optimal resistance to electrical attacks, but are surprisingly vulnerable to ooze. Yeah, and this is where the game became pretty difficult with the variety of enemies we were getting and all the different things they could do. And including in that is the ghostly walkers. Fair is far beyond the battlefield, Rabbit Peach once said. She was not referring to ghostly walkers at the time, but might as well have been. They turn invisible while moving, rendering any reflexive reaction abilities worthless. There is one counter tactic. Frostbite charged attacks freeze them in their tracks, but we must be careful. When surrounded, they repel foes with strong gusts of wind. Yep, that was definitely a problem. Bedrock, ooh, this was a fun fight. Another spark hunter crossed our path, Bedrock. Cursa has merged rabid DNA with an inanimate object, in this case, a coarse granite rock, massive, hard, and tough. Bedrock is impossibly strong, an unstoppable force let loose upon the sparks. Our sole advantages are that she is as dense as the granite she sprang from, as well as our alliance with Bowser, whom Bedrock respects as her equal in combat. Yeah, that was a pretty intense fight when we got introduced to Bowser there. Princess Peach. What more can be said of Princess Peach? She is kind-hearted, yes, but also brave, and always putting the welfare of the other heroes before her own. She even has compassion for our enemies, a charismatic, capable, yet humble hero. It is little wonder she is so beloved by rabbits everywhere. When she is not busy saving the galaxy, the Mushroom Kingdom is elevated by her presence. Aw, I definitely agree. Rabid Luigi. An analysis of Rabid Luigi's earlier adventures versus the Megabug revealed that he has matured much since then. Yet, he clearly maintains a childlike role within the group. However, his relationship with the other heroes is as complimentary as his naivete is a welcome breath of fresh air. Does he make me smile as well? I have not the anatomical capacity, but the emotion? Yes, and I believe he does. Ah. So yeah, Robin Luigi makes me smile too. The Dryad. Bioforms are so unpredictable. The Dryad of the Spellbound Woods has been foiled to Sweet Lopec the Lumberjack for so long they became bitter adversaries. Yet, even after their feud reached its crescendo, the pair built a bridge, both literally and figuratively, between the worlds of nature and industry. Balance, compassion, kindness, these much more than blasters may be the key to setting the galaxy right. I'm glad that over the time they've been able to put their differences aside and get close to one another. The mystery of love. Earlier, I observed two bioforms who were enemies and ideological opposites find a common understanding which led to respect and then love all in an afternoon. How did two creatures who have spent so much time in direct conflict become so infatuated with one another? Was it the intensity of their feelings that, when turned on their head, brought them together? Will I ever understand it? Can I? Hopefully one day, you never know. And then that's all of them for Palette Prime. Now we're moving on to Terraflora with the Wiggler Express Train. On Terraflora, we became acquainted with the Terraflora railway system, which connects its central station to the base of Mount Spout and is run by its charming conductor Sullivan. Some consider steam trains to be antiquated, but the train on Terraflora operates in harmony with its floral surroundings. It is a masterpiece of engineering. Awesome, I had so much fun riding that thing. The uh, Wiggler boss fight was so interesting, but now we have the Oozers. Once again, it is not just the tactics employed by our enemies, but their synthesis that speaks to Curse's villainy. These mages unleash an ooze-based attack and have the ability to make the heroes even more vulnerable to it through special abilities. One denies heroes the aid of any techniques or spark powers. The other denies heroes the use of their weapons. They are anathema to gust-based attacks. They were once again a really difficult variant of enemy to deal with. Now we have Mount Spawn. The secret to Terraflora's perpetually blossoming flora is a highly unique water volcano known as Mount Spout, which regularly discharges mineral-rich sparkling water into the planet's canals and aquifers. 
The rainbow-hued fields of flowers on Terra Flora may get all the glory, but it is the stark yet consistent volcano that allows them to thrive. It was very cool to explore. All of Terra Flora was really so pretty. And well, now we have the Druid's Vista. Water erosion from Terra Flora's Mount Spout created many cave passages over time. One such space served as a headquarters for the Druids, who were obsessed with uncovering the secrets behind the water's mysterious properties. It is located inside a lateral vent, the view from which is awe-inspiring. I agree, and it was pretty difficult to figure out that puzzle too. Now we have Bia the Busy Bee. We have yet to meet a warden who did not fascinate, and Terra Flora's Bia is no exception. A popular entertainer since a tender young age, when her career came to a halt, she could have wallowed in excess or let bitterness consume her. Instead, she reinvented herself as a flower farmer whose bouquets make hearts swell all over the galaxy, just as her music once did. Ah, it's such a wonderful story. Galactic Atlas, Terra Flora. Terra Flora's beauty is almost overwhelming, and the way the rabbits here have cooperated and collaborated with nature rather than bend it to their will is the reason why. The railroad tracks are made from plants and vines, the warden resides in the Everbloom tree, and everything is irrigated using a natural spring. The effort expended must have been extraordinary, but it was well worth it. I agree, because it is so pretty now that we've sort of fixed up the place. Magnafowls! I could be forgiven for not taking these creatures seriously at first sight, for isn't that the purpose of a rubber chicken? Not in this case. The unconventional weapon acts as a magnet, drawing heroes to it against their will, where they can be pounded like a cutlet. The rubber weapon gives them resistance to electricity, while their feline penchant for cleanliness makes them susceptible to filthy ooze attacks. I can't believe they found a way to work the rubber chicken into the reason why they're resistant to electricity. That is so funny. Now we have Sullivan. Eloquent, proficient, and passionate, Sullivan is the chief train engineer on Terra Flora. But for him, it is no mere job. He is a lover of all things mechanical, and has a strong attachment to his beloved steam train, which he cares for with a tender hand. After his train, there is his timetable. He takes pride not just in being punctual, but in being someone the rabbits of Terra Flora can count on. And I definitely agree. Sullivan was very cool and also very flirtatious towards Genie. A different appreciation. Oh, and here we go. Sullivan, the train engineer on Terra Flora, took an interest in me. And not just for my link to the hero spaceship. He was courteous, but he also made me feel, feel, well, he made me feel. I felt appreciated but in a different way than when Beepo or a hero expresses gratitude. I felt something else as well. Too new for me to process, let alone articulate. Only that I found it quite pleasant. Ah, well maybe it isn't too late, you know, experience some of that love you were talking about before. Edge, ooh. I will confess to having monitored Edge for the simple reason that she is an enigma, making it difficult to know if she can be trusted fully. What is known is that she is a skilled fighter, wielding her flying sword as if it were a part of her. I do trust her, though I cannot explain why. Is it instinct? Wishful thinking? Hope? Perhaps it is all three, for what really is the difference? We found out more about Edge and their backstory in the final episode that we just had. Rabbit Rosalina. Analysis, data, evidence, these allow AIs such as myself to look beyond the surface. Still, rabid Rosalina defies my expectations. She is lethargic, jaded, cynical, and perpetually annoyed. But woo to the bioform that gets between her and someone she loves, especially if that someone is Rosalina, her idol. Born of the famous basement incident, rescued by Orion, she is now one of us. And I'm so happy for that because I think at least personality-wise, she's probably my favorite character out of all the playable ones. And then we have the Alchemator. We met the last of the druids on Terra Flora, heir to all their research and knowledge gleaned from Mount Spout's mysterious mineral spring water. 
The druids of old had reputations as makers of powerful potions, yet this one seems more inclined to fuse spring water with delicious fruit combinations. Whether it is to fund more important work or to prove that zero calories doesn't mean zero taste, I cannot know. Me neither. And that was the last one for Terra Flora, so now we have the Baron Del Mesa, the Ring Stabilizer. With little trees or vegetation to stave off erosion, Mama needed a solution to keep Berendale Mesa from falling apart, and fast. Having no one to rely on but herself, she invented the Ring Stabilizer to uphold the environmental integrity of the planet. Once the soil can be enriched, planting will begin anew. Perhaps by our next visit, it will have been transformed again, this time for the better. Ooh, I would love to see that. Or Berendale Mesa reimagined with more plant life and stuff? That'd be awesome. The windmill. Once, this windmill was used to harness gusts of wind to mill grain and pump water. Mama has since adapted it to be a renewable source of electricity, with which Berendale Mesa can be restored to its former glory. For those who wish to reach the base of the generator, cranes and moving platforms must be used in lieu of ladders, elevators, or any remotely safe means of scaling. Okay, and that was quite difficult to get to. It took us a lot of time in that episode. The Spell Razors. The cowardly Spell Razor prefers to keep its distance, targeting heroes from long range with a powerful bolt of menacing energy. When not so engaged, it summons other minions of Curse's army to do its dirty work for it. It feels right at home when in contact with slime and ooze, but is vulnerable to attacks that make use of gusts of wind. And those spell razors caused quite a few predicaments, but in certain situations when they were spawning in enemies, I could actually make it easier if we were just trying to defeat a certain amount for a quest. Either way, now it's time for Mama. Our visit to Berendale Mesa was a critical diversion meant to enlist the help of Mama, Warden and Master Mechanic. The endlessly inventive rabbits there were without direction until her arrival, but she has since served as a mentor and mother figure to them. I agree, and it was so nice. I think Mama might be my favorite Warden, the Garage. Berendale Mesa is isolated, cut off from civilization by distance and choice. This necessitates a particular genius for making silk purses out of Sal's ears, using repurposed technology and salvaged parts in ways that defy imagination. Like most geniuses, Mama is extremely protective of her workspace. No one is allowed in her garage, lest they disturb the meticulous surroundings within. Yep, we gotta be careful with that. We don't wanna mess up Mama's workspace. Galactic Atlas, Baron Del Mesa. Berendale Mesa was not always barren. After arriving, the rabbits quickly depleted its natural resources with little thought to the future, transforming this once verdant Mesa into a wasteland. Mama has changed the rabbits' attitudes, but changing the landscape will take more time. Yet, the planet is not without charm. Its panoramic views inspire, and its canyons offer much in the way of exploration. Mesa, Mesa, however you pronounce it, it was a lot of fun to explore. Magikoopas. Of all Bowser's minions that were usurped by Cursa, Magikoopas are amongst the most troublesome, and it is not difficult to see why. They are powerful magicians who are adept at enhancing and reinforcing their allies on the battlefield, timing their efforts wisely. Cursa has made them immune to all super effects. Okay, well, Magikoopas were pretty scared to go on, but with that being said, we focused on them pretty quickly in whatever battle we were in, so they were never too crazy of a threat. Riptides. Amongst all the rabid feline mutations, these are perhaps the ones that cause me the most concern for our heroes. The more they are hurt, the more harm they manage to cause with each successful assault, and they will doggedly pursue any hero who successfully lands a blow, no matter where they are. Being water-based, splash-focused attacks are of little use, but ones incorporating electricity are highly effective. Ooh, okay. So yeah, we obviously battled a lot of these guys too. Not the easiest to go against, but here we have Daphne. It was on Berendale Mesa that we crossed paths with the most vile, corrupt spark hunter of them all, Daphne. 
She toyed with us like a cat would a mouse, though she is derived from neither. Cursa instead fused rabbit DNA with a rare species of pink climbing rose, those often found in secretive corners of moonlit gardens. She is sneaky and uses her thorns well, not to defend, but to destroy. Quite a formidable foe, but we were in a really good groove when we took her on and were able to defeat it not too bad, but now we have hope. Seeing Rosalina free herself from Curse's control only to be retaken brought us to our lowest of lows and our highest of highs, thankfully in that order. It could have gone so differently, but I wanted, no, needed to feel hope, and so I found my reasons. Mama agreed, and the heroes rallied, and we were united and revitalized. Such a small and tangible thing, hope, yet it is everything. I definitely agree. It's always good to have hope, and we got so much of it when we saw this crystal, so glad that happened. And then we have Drispard. It is a mistake to assume that Barrendel Mesa is home to only Mama and a few rabbits. Other colorful figures have sought refuge there from more constrictive society, including the artist Gerspard and his most devoted critic, Dada. Gerspard is behind the greatest works of the galaxy, from the frescoes of the Sunrise Temple to the murals of Barrendel Mesa, always with Dada nearby, quietly judging. All right, so yeah, that was an interesting side quest. I enjoyed that one. Oh, and it's Bowser. It is surprising that our truce with Bowser lasted longer than our first battle together, yet his desire for revenge against Cursa for commandeering his minions has thus far proved stronger than his longing to kidnap Princess Peach or his animosity towards Mario. Bioforms are motivated by a number of factors, not all of which are necessarily virtuous. That's true. While Bowser's usually an enemy, in this game he was a friend. And speaking of friends, we have Mario! Stout-hearted, selfless, humble, virtuous, are these enough to describe Mario, by far the most storied hero among us? Would any such plaudits serve? I can only speak for myself when I say that the accolades are well deserved. Mario's kindness and bravery inspire everyone around him, even myself. As much as anyone or anything, Mario has taught me to feel, and from there, to hope. Okay, well, there we go. And that should be all of the Baron Del Mesa uh, memories. So we just have the couple left here on Curse of Stronghold, starting with the broken statue. During the battle with Edge's Darkness doppelganger, I noticed four statues, one given to each of the three Spark Hunters met so far. Midnight, Bedrock, and Daphne, and one that had been destroyed to the point where it was unrecognizable. Huh. That's weird. I didn't notice that while battling, because obviously I was focused on the battling, but I don't recognize that one. That's definitely not Edge, which is what I would assume, because Edge was also a spark hunter. Is there another one out there? Guess we'll have to wait and see. And then we have Cursa. There is no question that Cursa is more powerful, cunning, and relentless than any single one of us. Yet together, with aid from Rosalina, it was vanquished. Still, its corrupting influence reached nearly every corner of the galaxy, where much of it lingers still. We have stopped the darkness at its source, but we have much work to do if we are to remove the rest before it can cause any more harm. But as it currently stands, there isn't too much more work to do. We've completed the game 100%, but I'm sure if more DLC comes out, then there'll be more work to be done. And finally, a message from an outer dimension. I received a most curious communication. It reads as follows. You don't know me. However, you could say that we're related. I invented Beepo, and I'm proud to see how he's evolved from a virtual assistant to a thinking, feeling, if not a little grouchy, bonafide hero. Come to think of it, you and Bebo have a lot in common. You just got there with a lot less help. Who sent this, and why? Ooh, so that's an interesting little bit of the story, because if you remember the beginning of Kingdom Battle, Bebo wasn't originally from this world, but 
from an entirely different one. The story is very interesting. Obviously, if you want to see those cutscenes, go see our Kingdom Battle series. But that is so cool that they sort of looped everything around like that. Oh man, these memories were great. They added so much to the story and to the background of these characters. I loved hearing all that stuff. So beyond that, what is there really left to do in this game? The only thing I can think of that we can do besides, you know, checking out those memories is making sure that all of our sparks are maximum level at level five. So there's a couple of them I just haven't gotten around to doing. So I guess we can just upgrade them with either spark potions or star bits, whatever we have available for us. So we'll do that. And then, oh no, I wasn't done. That's not what I meant to press. Oh boy. Um, We'll just make sure that this is done. That way we can say we've maxed out everything we possibly have access to. So let's go ahead and upgrade the vamp dash a little bit. Maybe it would just be faster to do it this way. So I might just do that. I mean, it sticks on the screen for a little bit, so I guess it's sort of the same difference, but we have these star potions sitting here, not really doing much, so we might as well put them to work by leveling all this stuff up. There we go, so Vamp Dash is now level five. So if we head back from here, who else can we upgrade? You, Glitter, we can level up. Very nice. Oh no, I didn't, I meant the back out of that screen, the, the controls are weird there, sorry. Um, Who else do we have? I think it's just a few more. Here is Screech. Let's upgrade you, give you a star potion. And another. So there we go, you're all beefed up to level five. And then over here we have one more or two more at level four. We have the Reflector. We'll give you a star potion and get you to level five. And then lastly, I think right over here, the Exosphere. And then we'll have one more star potion left over. It all worked out in the end, right? So, yeah, as far as I can tell, that is every single spark maxed out the level five. So in the DLC, if there's new sparks, we'll definitely try to max them out too. But yeah, we did great. We got all the keys, we just we got everything. It was a lot of hard work and it was a lot of fun too. Lots of challenges completed along the way and I'm excited to tackle more of them as more DLC comes out. But for right now, that for real this time is going to complete everything in Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye bye.